You know, try that again. It's a true test of patience at times. It has nothing to do with dogs, but we'll see if this is going to work or not. So I'm going to wait and see uh, if we do get some people back on. I apologize for the awful internet service of AT&T. Uh, it does look like we're back. Um, so we will see if we can get some people back on. I'm not going to move this that much. What I wanted to do was, you guys know that, you guys that have watched these before, Chris Borgman's in, Hunter is in, um, Mike Schulte's in, Mike, I thought you were at a Whitetails Unlimited dinner, Jeremy Miner is in, Scott Atkins is back. I think Scott said he was new. Carrie, welcome, Carrie. So we've got some people coming back on. So that was just a good warm up for you guys. Chris Wyatt Anderson joined in. Welcome, Wyatt. Um, it was a good test uh, to see how poor our, our internet service is, and it proves it to me again. Um, so I'm I'm going to get started tonight, and I want to talk a little bit different than what we have been. Uh, Joe is in, GSO Deuce is in, Jake is in, uh, Jenny ba Becker is back, Eric Yeager is back, Joe McAllister, Scott, welcome guys. So, tonight's going to be a little bit different, Finesse is in, um, I want to talk about shed stuff specifically, and the reason I want to is because we, if you noticed, um, I've made some posts on it, um, it's been floating around a little bit, um, George is in, Stephanie Brewer, Wyatt. Dog bone and gymnastics. All sorts of stuff going on, Wyatt. Um, if you've noticed that this shed rally is going to go on, and so I thought I'd talk a little bit about shed rally. Now, you can hear, as soon as I start doing this, we get some activity going on. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it so you can see us both, so that you can kind of see. I'm not paying attention to that. So some of you guys that have little pups... Um, we've talked about, I had a question today that asked about place training, which that's all that is, is place training. She didn't vanish off of it. She's just going to the other end. Um, but place training, people are struggling with some of these little pups. And the, they're noisy in their kennels and all that stuff. We're not going to talk so much the foundation stuff, although I do, obviously, you guys know it. I think it's extremely important. But tonight we're going to focus on the fun stuff, which is shed, the actual shed training. Sean's in, Clint's in, Mark is in. Um, welcome, guys. Um, we're going to talk about the more fun stuff. That's easier for people to get into. It's easier for people to get excited about. I've got Ellie laying right or sitting right there in our shop. I've got Taylor laying right over here on a bed. And then I've got Spry back there. Now, one of the things we've talked about is how as soon as I get on the phone to to the um, live stuff, my dog seems to this little dog comes unglued and really, really, really gets excited. Jamie's in. Amber's in. Welcome, guys. Um, kiddos are watching from Nebraska, it sounds like, so we've really got to be on our best tonight. Ryan's in. Welcome, Ryan. Um, so the shed rally. So I want to talk about shed stuff. I probably will do spry later tonight when we feed her. Um, I'm not going to talk about a lot of the foundation stuff. I am going to use this as an opportunity because whenever we get started with our normal training thing, it seems to just push a, put a quarter in her, and she just comes to life, and she gets whiny, and she gets fussy, and... Look at her right now. I mean, she's just she's just hamming it up over there. So I'm not going to pay attention to it. It's something that I don't want to reward. Um, I had a question this morning that was about one of our very first lives. One of the things I did was I went back and I numbered every single live in order. So if you guys haven't seen these, if you guys are new to these, you can go back now and you can see them. They're all numbered. I did that so that I did that because actually someone asked me to. Uh, Mike asked me. Uh, Carrie's in, or no, Carl is in. Hey, Carl. He's our helper that helped us set up the, helped Steph this last weekend out of Milwaukee. Jeremy Thies is in. Ryan is in. Mike Mecca joined. Welcome, guys. So, um, one of the things that I talk, I saw was someone went back and watched the very first live we ever did with Spry, and it was place training. They asked us about when the dog gets noisy, fussy, barking, whining, how do I discipline it? How do I correct it? Here's my fix. My fix is disassociation. Don't pay any attention to it. So it takes a lot, a lot of will, a lot of strength to be able to tune it out. Trust me. Nothing drives me. It's like nails on a chalkboard when a dog does that to me. I can't stand it. Drives me absolutely crazy. 
had to make sure she wasn't going to the bathroom because I was going to say, gosh, am I an idiot? She whines and fusses to go outside and, and she has an accident. She's done that to me before. So that comes with getting a feel for the dog. But right now, she's full of energy. She was outside not too long ago and went to the bathroom. Taylor's right next to her and she's just being very, very tested as to whether or not she's going to go over here and mess with Taylor. So we're going to leave her alone. And tonight we're going to leave the puppy stuff alone. I am going to try to retrieve with the puppy because I want to make a point of some of our early retrieving stuff when it comes to shape conditioning to the antler. Because tonight is more fun. Tonight is, I think by a lot of people's um, ideas, it's going to be more fun. Because we're going to talk about shed hunting. We're going to talk about the fun stuff, the good stuff, the more advanced stuff. The reason I'm doing it, kind of doing it out of order is this. Shed, I just looked on the computer, that kind of weirded my leg like that. So I'm not going to do that. But... Um, one of the things that we're involved with is a thing called Shed Rally. And I've had a lot of people ask questions about it. What is this Shed Rally thing? So Shed Rally is something that Whitetail Properties has put together. And we are really, really proud to be a part of it. Um, I, think we, I think we're filling a really important part of the idea of it. And that is the aspect, obviously, the connections of dogs when it comes to shed hunting. So what is Shed What is Shed Rally? I think a lot of people are confused with it. They think it's something that is physically, you have to show up to it, or it's, it's held in one location or one spot. It's not. It's across like the whole North America. I, I would imagine it could be across the world. Um, I don't know how many people will be taking part of it outside of North America, but um, Canada, the U.S., whether you're in the West or the East or the Midwest, the South, it really doesn't matter. It's the idea of combining or bringing together this is i talked a little bit about um the value of some of the stuff with social media today i think a lot of people bag on it and talk about how bad it is and the negatives associated with it and i think there's a lot of that but i think there's some really good things with it too we won't be able to do this without social media we won't be able to provide some of the training stuff that we do we won't be able to interact with people that are interested in in knowing more about training so i think those are the upsides of social media this is another one where Shed hunting in general, this is a way that it's designed so that wherever you are, any part of the country, any groups, and they've got it broken down into some categories that are really nice, I think a great idea, but it's to unite shed hunting in general. They picked March 18th and 19th this year, which is Saturday and Sunday. Uh, in the past, it's been different weeks. In the past, it was earlier. I know, I know it fell a few years ago. It always fell on... Um, the Iowa Deer Classic weekend because I used to do I was doing seminars for the Iowa Deer Classic uh, three four years ago and that was the weekend and the problem with it was is up here where I am in the north that year there was so much snow it was just down in the south it was perfect but so I think they've gone to more of a uh, neutral date to try to accommodate everybody but it's two days this year it used to be one day now it's two days so it's Saturday and it's Sunday and it's basically just an excuse to get out shed hunting. And, the, and unite through it through social media. So all you have to do, um, yeah, there's several new people came in, so welcome you guys. Clint came in, Chris came in, Kelly came in, Shh, Mavis Outdoors is in. Um, all you got to do is hashtag, this is my favorite, my kids will go hashtag, hashtag Shed Rally. So get your pictures and your videos. It's YouTube, or not YouTube, it's uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I think those are the three things. If you ha if you find something, if you got cool pictures, um, everyone can take good pictures nowadays because we have such good phones. But you can take a picture, have it be out in the field, or back at your trucks, or wherever you want, be creative with it, and then post them and hashtag Shed Rally. And then what they'll be able to do is they'll be able to uh, combine all, look at all those pictures. Um, in one source, Whitetail Properties can, and they're going to pick some winners, um, some of their favorites. And some of the categories, they've got several categories. They've got ladies, they've got men's, they've got family. Um, there's several categories. I put a post up on our on our Facebook page that breaks it down. And then there's prizes. They're going to pick out winners. Um, we are in for, I think, four or five categories where we're going to be giving $100 worth of dog bone stuff uh, to a winner, $75 worth of stuff. So it's it's product stuff. Great people involved with it. Um, Realtree is in it, in on it. Uh, Legendary Whitetails, uh, Yeti, little company called Yeti, um, Dogbone, big company called Dog. No. Uh, so, 
I'm trying to think who else. Scentlock is in on it, and then Whitetail Properties. Um, I don't think I missed anybody. But some really, really good, good sponsors. Um, something that we're real proud of. So the idea of tonight is we're going to talk specifically on shed training. And I think there's some questions that come up. So you guys know that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a notes guy. I'm a post-it note guy. I got post-it notes all over. So tonight I combined some of my post-it notes. Um, I ended up with a paper full of them. You know, it's not a ton of stuff, but it is enough stuff to keep us busy. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna show you who has decided to come in on this. So just sit. Sit. She's been sitting about three feet before, and as I kind of got excited and kind of got ramped up, all of a sudden I got Ellie's in on this. So Ellie's excited because we're actually going to use her tonight. Um, she's going to have a nice opportunity to do some stuff with us. But I want to talk about a couple things first. Um, the first thing was, and I had put it as number five, but I actually talked about it first because I think it's the point of this whole thing. You sit. Um, was what is Shed Rally. So if you guys have questions, uh, fire away. Fire away. I don't know if I'll be able to catch them as we go, but I will catch them before we get done. So... Um, touched on what Shed Rally is and why we're doing it and, and w what it kind of entails. Um, so I wanted to talk specifically about shed training for dogs. We haven't done it much live. I have done it in a lot of seminars. Um, we just did a seminar at Cabela's a couple weeks ago. We talked a lot about shed training. Um, I haven't done it necessarily on the live platform for our social media. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about the questions that come up more often associated with shed training. I have realized that no matter how hard I try and how much I want to, I can't explain shed training and I can't explain dog training in a seminar. Just don't have enough time. I can't even do it in a weekend. I can't do it during a workshop. That's three days. So I've tried to do it because I always feel like I want to try to give as much stuff to you guys as far as information. I've realized it's impossible to do it all. So Tonight, I'm just going to touch on some of the ones that I hear so often because I'm sure it's questions that you guys might have. So the, the first thing I'm just going to say, want to, want to go about is the idea of how do, we, how, how do we really go about training our shed dogs and why do we do it the way we do it and why do our dogs have tendencies to have some success with it. So it's, I don't think it's very difficult. I don't think it's difficult at all. I think the shed training part comes pretty easy. In fact, I will go out on a limb and say it comes easy. Um, I think that the game recovery, the tracking part, which we do with a lot of our dogs, most of our dogs, in addition to shed training, comes even easier. And the reason I say it is because I think it's very natural. Dogs don't, I think we've got to talk about why do shed dogs retrieve sheds? Well, shed dogs don't just like sheds. They don't retrieve, this dog, this dog right here has been bred. She looks like she's got a black eye. She's got dust on her. This dog right here, I'll spin this, has been bred for hundreds and hundreds of years to have specific inherent traits. Okay? She's, she's been bred to have natural game finding ability, strong nose. I don't like her creeping up on me. She's got a strong nose, natural game finding. She's got natural retrieve. She's got, she, one of the things that I like about her is she's got, she had a pretty nice delivery. That was genetic. That was bred to her. She's got a very soft mouth. I won't allow that. I'm not going to allow that creeping up on me. She really wants to. But the other things that she's gotten is she's really intelligent. She's really smart. She's really trainable. She has a willingness to please me. All stuff that she wants that's been bred in for a long, 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 long time. Now... Why does she? Why do I say she's a shed dog? Well, because she goes to find sheds. I think let's back up. What is a shed dog? I think there's a misconception out there of what a shed dog really is, what they do. I think a lot of people think when we get shed dogs, we sit in the truck and drink coffee and let them fill the back with sheds. It doesn't happen that way. I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, bubble, but it just doesn't work that way. They're not robots. The they're not, if you don't set your dog up for success in shed hunting, you're not going to find sheds, okay? No different than me, if I, the best shed dog in the world won't find sheds if there aren't sheds there. And I think a lot of people think that as soon as they train their dogs to find sheds, they're going to start finding a lot of sheds. If there aren't sheds there, guys, you don't find them. So we have to set our dogs up for success. And so that's as simple as putting them in places where sheds are going to be. 
just because you don't find them in the past doesn't mean that they're, they, they were there and you walked over them. Now, did you walk over some? Yeah, probably. And will the dogs help? Absolutely. No question about it. But I think what is interesting is a lot of people realize, or a lot of people think that if they train their dog to find sheds, they magically appear and they just don't. So the other thing to understand too is that these dogs are just like any other type of working dog. They need a lot of experience in order to have success when it comes to sheds. The problem that happens is, so I'll back, so now I'll back up again. So why does, why, does, why does this dog like sheds? The reason this dog likes sheds, the reason that one likes sheds, and the reason that one eventually is gonna like sheds is because I'm going to condition in the shape of an antler and the smell of an antler to equal a reward. And for my dogs, the reward is the retreat, okay? So when I get this shape started with that little young dog, it's going to be associated to something that's fun. The reason, let me grab this. Here's a real one. Here's a training dummy. Very similar. They're not all the same. They're very similar. And by me, when, when it comes to bird dogs and gun dogs and duck dogs and pheasant dogs, I've heard a lot of people say that, yeah, I got really good genetics. She's a duck dog. Well, now all of a sudden you hear a lot of people talk about genetics with shed dogs. They're breeding shed dogs. Uh, there's kennels out there that are specialized in shed dogs. There's dogs that are champion shed dogs, all this stuff. So when I start hearing about that stuff, I think I have a lot of thoughts about it. But what I think is my duck dog is not bred to be a duck dog. My duck dog was bred to have a good nose, to be trainable, to be, have natural retrieve and soft mouth and lots of traits that they have. And then I take that duck dog and I turn it into a duck dog. But before it gets to me, it could be a shed dog or it could be a drug dog or a police dog or a cadaver dog or a diabetic alert dog or a truffle hunting dog or a morel dog. It could be any of that stuff because the traits have to be there first. So once you have that, we form them and mold them into what we want. So shed dogs aren't born loving sheds. Just like duck dogs aren't born loving ducks. So I've had people argue with me about the idea when it comes to the bird stuff. Because there's a lot, bird dogs, gun dogs have been around a long time and they're, they're very common. And I've had guys tell me, my dog just loves birds. I've had a lot of people say, my dog likes birds more than sheds. Okay. My dog likes ducks more than pheasants. Okay. I don't know if that's true or not. I, I highly doubt it. What I do think is this. We train our dogs to like certain things and that equals retreat. So when the guy tells me that his dog is just duck crazy, now I don't like this creeping up, so I'm going to show you how I fix it. Come here. Come on. Sit. Disassociation. I don't like it creeping up on me, so we're going to disassociate. She's just going to have to sit there for a while. So when people tell me that they re their dogs are big duck dogs and they just love ducks and they're crazy about ducks and all that stuff. Now... My question to them is, think about it this way. We're in Wisconsin, wherever you guys are from. When it gets, imagine it being very cold, very miserable, icy conditions, um, just really, really miserable weather-wise, okay? That's usually when the duck hunting gets really good. So imagine that, you got a duck dog, it's miserable conditions, there's birds coming in. So you shoot a duck and it sails across the marsh. And you have to send your dog through that marsh. It's muddy, sloppy, icy, frozen, terrible conditions. Most people wouldn't walk through it themselves. But that dog will break through all of that stuff to get on the other side and retrieve the duck. And I'll, I'll paint that picture for someone, for, for the guy that's real set on his duck dog. And I'll say, will your dog make that retreat? And he'll say, absolutely, my dog loves ducks. I say, okay, good. So. Now, dog goes through all that stuff and comes back with the bird. Yep, he loves the birds. I, t I asked them, if I took a stick and I threw it in the same spot, would your dog go get it? And they look at me, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, they'll go get it. They'll go through the same crap to go get that stick. And so my answer to them, there's the change I'm looking for. Very good. So that is then, well, is he a stick dog too? And they'll look at me and I'll catch him and they'll go, uh, I get it. So why, did I, why do I tell that story so often? Because 
We don't, dogs, no one breeds dogs as stick dogs. But retrievers retrieve sticks if we train them that sticks equal retrieve. And a lot of times it happens. So my argument is it's not the duck that drives the dog, it's the retrieve that drives that dog. My shed dog is the same thing. It's not the shed that drives my dog. It's the idea that it's connected to something that they like, which is a retrieve. <clears throat> so how do we get started with it? <clears throat> Shape is important to me. Shape is visual. Um, I, I think I take a very similar step to training shed, a, a similar approach to training shed dogs as I did when I used to train gun dogs and bird dogs. I still do bird dogs and gun dogs. Most of my dogs do both, or a, a lot of the dogs do a lot of different things. But retrieve is retrieved to them. And so in order to be able to get them to start understanding what retrieve is, <clears throat> I have to get them to start picking up certain things. Visually, it's very easy for them to understand. So if you guys have been watching, you guys understand the issues that I've had with this little puppy on retrieve. Um, I've struggled with it. So I'm going to show you with her because I might be able to get a retrieve out of her tonight. Okay. Um, if I don't, I think I have a backup plan. I'm going to try it without, but I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to leave this right here for now. I'm going to set it up. I'm going to move us around and I'm going to make a little puppy retrieve. It's going to be about the only thing we do with the puppy tonight. And the reason, uh, here anyway, and the reason I want to do it is because I want to show you guys, I'm going to put it back here because I don't know exactly how this is going to shake out. Now I'm going to have to talk a little louder. I don't have my mic tonight. Now, we're going to, I've got Spry, okay? So all I'm going to do is see if I can't get her to pick this up. So I'm going to put her down. I feel pretty confident with her. That's it. She goes right to a nice sit. So all I'm going to do is try to see if I can't get a little retrieve out of it. And if I can't, I'm going to go back to my backup plan that we tried earlier this week and had a little success with. So let's start out. The reason I'm using this and not that hard horn is because this little puppy, when I first started out, I used a hard horn and I had success. This is years ago. And then all of a sudden... I had a pup that was six months old. Now she's three months old. She's really little. But I had one that was about six months old, and I threw a horn that looked like that one over there. And she ran up to it, poked herself, cried and whined, came back to me with her tail between her legs and wanted nothing to do with antlers. So I figured out quickly that I can't introduce a dog, all dogs, the same way to everything. It's a lot like a gun-shy dog. Dogs that are afraid of guns aren't because they don't like guns. It's because they were introduced in a bad way to a loud noise. Negative connections. Don't make negative connections to things you want your dog to like. I want my dogs to like antlers. I want them to like the idea of retrieving them. They understand that this equals a retrieve. So in order to do that, I've got to make sure I have success. So let me see if I can't get this little pup to just get me a little retrieve. And the reason I really like doing this is because it's a very good example of how this teaches them a lot. And it teaches them a lot without the idea of getting hurt. Come here. She's full of energy. Sit. Now remember, I had a really hard time with her coming back. She's close, guys. Come on. Good. No, 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 no. Come on. Come on. Come on. So I'm going to move away. Come on. Good girl. Come on. That's a good girl. Come on. Come on. Spry. Good girl. Here. Okay. Ah, 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 ah. No. No. Good. Come on. Good. Come on. Come on. Very good. Come on. No, 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 no. Come on. Come on. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. No. Good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Good girl. Now, got through that one. Sit. Now that one got a little risky. And I probably, I don't want to do it again, to be honest with you. You can blow that one up with thumbs and parts all you want. I'll be honest with you. I'm real glad it happened that way. Um, it, 
just about turned into a disaster. Uh, but I'll take it. I'll really take it because it's way better than it has been. So I'm going to just try. I talked about this the other day that this little, this little cord, this is not a leash. This is actually from our drag. It's a drag line for our tracking kit. So I don't want to turn this into a wrestling match with this little dog. But I really don't want to get too firm with her either right now. So I'm putting this. Now she's, she's here's a test. She's kind of nipping at me. She stopped real quick because my tone got pretty serious. And if she had nipped at me any longer, I'd have made sure. Ah, 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 ah. That goes back to her testing. So I tell you guys, you know, she tests me once in a while too. Well, she got so excited, she kind of lost her mind a little bit. So now I'm going to go after this retrieve again, but I'm going to do it with this little check cord. And this check cord is not a really a check cord. It's a drag line for our tracking kit. It's so light she doesn't even know it's on her right now. But what I'm going to be able to do is get her to bump her on the neck to get my retrieve out of her. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Very good. Oh, gosh, I hope you saw that. I'm just smiling inside right now. Now, if you guys are new, I don't know what the number is right now. If you guys are new, first off, do me a favor and share this if you would. But if you guys are new, you'll, you won't realize the struggles I've gone through. I've really struggled to get a retrieve. That might be one of the better retrieves I've ever had. And I just gave her a little tap on the, on the lead. And the reason she, I think it's working this way is because she's very good at heel work. Extremely good for her age. Ah, ah. See that nip? I'm really torn to correct at this point because I'm just trying to get some success out of the retrieve and I don't want to turn this negative. Good girl. Come on. Come on. Come on. Good girl. Good. Come on. Good girl. Good girl. Hold. 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 Very nice. Dead. That's it. I'm done. I'm totally calling that a win, and we're going to work on that more often, have some more, find more success with it. So what I thought was interesting was, because she's so little, if that were the hard horn, first off, I don't think she would have picked it up. Uh, my dogs have really, really soft mouths. She's a really soft dog. No way she's picking that up. So, but what I'm grateful for is you can pick that up. Now I gotta get control. <laughs> come here. Come here. She goes, oh no. Back to this. Come here. Come on. No. Come here. Come. No. Come here. Now she wants to pick stuff. Come here. Good. You can see she goes, oh, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Come on. Kim. Kim. Good girl. Now, so that was great. That was great. That was, that was something that I've never had to use an influencer when it comes to retrieves like that. 99.999% of the, every dog I've trained prior to her has made a natural retrieve. All I had to do was close the doors in the hallway, roll a sock down, she'd go pick it, they'd pick, oh, pick it up and bring it back. I've seen you guys sending me videos that are way better retrieving than what I'm seeing with Spry. But I also have not seen her settle in so well on a tie out, give the pressure to the neck. She's doing great on her heel work. Her steadiness is really good. So if you guys are new to this, Spry has been worked on live for, I, I counted them today, it's 54 times we've gone live training Spry. Good evening, Vicki. Um, so we got some more people coming in too. Alan's in. Um, so Spry just did a nice little retrieve. Now, I'm going to show you. More of this retrieve stuff. I'm going to bring Ellie. Ellie, come here. I'm going to give you guys a view from behind me. Let's see. Now, here's what I do with my dogs. And here's what a lot of people do with their dogs. We're shape conditioning. We got the idea. They understand that this thing is going to start equaling retrieve through repetition and consistency. Doing this over and over and over, forming habits. A lot of people throw their antlers and their dogs just take off. And then they bring it back. And so this little dog is going to be a gun dog too. 
So I'm going to start instilling some steadiness. I've already started it with Spry. She's actually done it pretty naturally. She steadied herself up and then I send her. So now, I'm going to do the same thing, but I want you to watch. I want you to watch how this is hard to do. Hard for me to film it, have you guys see it good. So I'm going to try to leave it like this. Let's see if you can't see that dummy. I'll spin this around so you can see it from both angles. But I want you to see how this dog picks this up. Good. Come on. Good. Hold. 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 See how funny she's got it right now? Hold. See that? If, if she puts her head down right now, what is that time doing? Right into my throat. It's literally pushing the skin right now. Same with over here. Really uncomfortable position for her to pick it up. But does it bother her? The sign of the tail tells me no. She's okay with it. Okay? She has only picked up a hard horn a couple, dead, a couple times in her life. And it just happened recently. I'm going to give you another look at that. Again, this is where it really gets interesting when I try holding a phone and train. This phone gets in the way, guys. It creates static between me and her. Ellie. Good. Come on. Good girl. Much better. Hold. Hold. So we're, we're training with this retrieve how to pick this thing up. Sit. Good. Without the risk of the gun shy dog. Without the risk of the shed shy dog. The dog that says, the heck with it. These things hurt. They don't feel good. I tripped on it. It jabbed me. It poked me. For all they know, it bit them. Dead. Good girl. Now, that's great, right? So all right, my dog retrieves it every time I throw it. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put some scent on it because we go shake first, we go scent second, and I go feel last. It's a lot like the way I do my bird dogs. Shape first, bring out just predator prey. It's not even a bird to start out with. It's a balled up sock. And then I go to puppy bumpers. Then I go to canvas bumpers. Then I tape wings to them. Then I add scent to them. Then I use cold game, fresh kill game, live pigeons. All these things before a pheasant dog ever sees a pheasant, before a duck dog ever sees a duck. Before my shed dog sees the shed, I'm going to set him up similar. So we've got this. So I can throw it and my dogs make retrieves. Well, then people take scent. They put it on there. And then they put the dog in the house and they go hide this in a set-aside field. And they take the dogs through and they work them. And the dog doesn't have success. And they go, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I get an email that says, hey, my dog, sometimes my dog even sees it, runs up to it, smells it, and then keeps going. So then I start asking questions. Okay, how did you get to the point where you're at? Well, I throw it every time and he gets, retrieves it. I, he never misses it. I can then throw it into the worst, thickest, nastiest cover in the world and that dog goes in there, finds it, and brings it back. But then when it's laying on the ground, they walk right past it or they smell it and then they go away. What's, what, where, where are we missing? So I tell a lot of people, that's like going from A to Z. And you can't go from A to Z. I can't get, I couldn't take that little puppy and go from bringing her home and having her whine and fuss and cry to sitting her in my kitchen and doing remotes and walking around her, remote sits with distractions and all sorts of stuff. That's A to Z. I had to reverse engineer everything we've done up to this point. I had to build it step by step by step by step by step. And if I miss a step, if I never did heel work, with her, with Spry, if I never did heel work and I never, prior to heel work, I didn't tie her out to get her to understand to give to the pressure of the neck, I couldn't do what I just did tonight. Because by me pulling on the leash or on that little cord, I wouldn't have gotten the response of, well, come on over. I'd have got the response of, brace up. It's natural for them to brace against you. Pressure against the neck, they brace up. When I tie them out for the first time, that first time she stood like a statue for some time before she realized I can move. She was like paralyzed. I don't want, so I have to take those steps first before I can get to Z. So here's how I'm going to do that. It's a really easy step. It's something we do tons and tons and tons of with bird dogs, gun dogs, shed dogs, doesn't matter. One thing you got to understand, this camera's flipped. This is my left. Looks like my right. I'm not kidding. This is my left. It's my wedding ring. It's on my left hand. So the camera really reverses everything and throws everybody off and me too. But now watch this. Because this is the next step that I'm going to take. Ellie, here. No. Here. Now, 
Now when I say this is the next step, this is just a drill that I'm taking, I'm making. Now, from this point to what I'm going to do looks very similar to what I had done three minutes ago when I pitched it down and she went and got it. But what happened in between there is the difference. Ellie. Here, reaching around, figuring out the best way to pick this thing up. Good girl. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Good girl. Hold. Hold. Part of it is she's picking up off of a concrete floor. And that's new to her too. I don't do much retrieving in a warehouse. I'm doing it tonight because I hope we have Wi-Fi. <laughs> now, the difference between that was this. I walked out with her on heel, under control. I set the antler down. I turned around and I came back. I turned around and I sent her. I put some time and some distance in between there. Now, the reason why this is so important is... That retrieve was different than the first one for her. The first one came for me. I threw it. I sent her. This one, we walked down. It laid on the ground. She came back. She turned around. She looked. And that was very similar. So I knew I, she was, I felt really strong she was going to have success with it. But it was drastically different to her in the fact that this time it didn't throw. I didn't throw it. She actually had to pick it up off the ground. So now all of a sudden it's going to start making sense to my dog that when they see it on the ground, that's the same thing as when he throws it. And they got to be trained and understand that that's a habit that they need to form. The habit needs to be, if you see this thing and eventually smell this thing, it equals a reward. The reward is the retreat. So that's, the, that's, the visual, that's some visual stuff. Let's go on to scent stuff. So you saw me put some antler scent on it. I'm going to do this. I want to show you a couple of things because I think it comes up with a lot of questions. So let me grab, let me grab this tennis ball. Here's our stick scent. The stick scent is really good uh, in wet conditions. I use it. These training dummies float, okay? So I'll use these training dummies. This this ball right here is about dead. It's about when you get a new tennis ball, it's real fuzzy. These are about dead. These are about too old. Now this one has a little more life left to it. You can kind of see the see the pink fuzz on it. So I'm going to use that one. But what I want to do is I want to show you guys something when it comes to scent. I have liquid and I have stick. Different applications for different things. Uh, my scent, my liquid. I'll shake it up. Now we batch. I batch all these myself. I make the liquid scent. I send it to Conquest, and Conquest puts it in a stick. So it's the same liquid now. Watch real closely. See how that starts to absorb into it? That's why if it wasn't a newer tennis ball, it would just beat up and go off of it. And it's not holding the way I want. Tennis balls are great training tools because they're so absorbent and they lay really great scent trails. So what I want to show is how I sent this tennis ball up real good. Okay. Now, you'll be able to see it on this floor. And this will also be a test for Ellie on steadiness. But watch this ball. Okay, so the ball goes and rolls off into the corner. That's fine. The reason I like the hard floor, I'm gonna show you this. You won't, I'll have to get where the light, I hope you can see the reflection of the light. Um, you're never gonna be able to see it on this. So if I look right here, See that? There's a speck. Uh, see that? That's a mist. There's where the ball hit the ground. There's all these little specks. This spot right, where was that one? Right here? That's where the ball hit the ground. Okay. Trying to find another one. So that, now I look like I'm on my hands and knees deer tracking, tracking a wounded deer, right? Well, guess what we use this for? We use these scented tennis balls, liquid, Here's another spot. See where that's all fine mist. Okay, that was where the first ball first hit. So that just laid a beautiful little scent trail. Now it smells like an antler. Looks like a tennis ball. Why do I associate, what am I always trying to do? I'm always trying to associate positives to the antler, right? I don't want to associate negatives to the antler. So when I use this, I'm associating something that feels pretty good in a soft mouthed dog. 
I'm associating something that's not going to create negative by jabbing, poking. You saw how Ellie retrieved it the first time. If it were a hard heart, it would have been jabbed right into her throat because she picked it up funny. Well, she's getting used to this. She's new to it. So, now, what I want to do is I want to have this little dog. I'm going to just send her on this line. Now, it's a concrete floor. It's really not, not great for simulating real things. But if we were outside, the green tennis ball and the grass, the pink tennis ball and the cover or brush would be perfect because there's color contrast and that it's hard for them to see. It'll force them to use their nose. So for the guys that have, the, for the guys and girls that have the puppies, you hear the whining, you hear the fussing. I'm not paying any attention. In fact, if it keeps up and it gets to be too much, to me, I kind of get to a point where I kind of zone it out. I have to, or I'll go nuts. Otherwise, if it gets to be too bad, I'll take the pup and I'll just set her outside. As long as it's not super cold out, disassociation is the punishment. It's not me verbally correcting, because that's just praise. She thinks it's attention. So we gotta, we gotta, I gotta tune it out. And it's, that's, that's static. That's, that's hard for me to get through. I get distracted with it easily. So I'm gonna take this little dog. Come here, come here. Now watch her nose. She'll have a hard time walking past any of this stuff without putting her nose down. Now, this is different. It's, she just watched the thing roll in there. So will she really truly track it in? Probably not, but will she smell it? For sure, because there's a scent cone right through there right now where we just misted that trail. Ellie? She's gonna have to use her nose when she gets in there. So here, now she'll have to use the nose. Find it, find it, find it. Now it might be a tough one because she might have to get down. Good girl, right here. Very good, hold, hold, hold. Now, doesn't look like an antler, but I sure made it smell like an antler. And I associated it with something she loves. So that's one of the steps that we take for getting the scent in it and making sure that it's positive. Now, when I talk about that stick scent, that wax-based scent, that's a stick that I can put on this, and then I can throw this in the water. And now I've got dogs. You ever, bird dogs, I, I, gun dogs, I should say. I do drills with gun dogs where we have some ducks that we have shackled ducks and we have different drills where they'll go across the water and my dogs track across the water. That's easy for them. There's oils, there's all sorts of scent that sit on the water as long as the water's not running. That's relatively simple, it's relatively easy. I can get the same drills out of this little shed dog and I can associate the idea of the antler being connected to another thing they like. Because guess what? When's the last time you found one of these retrievers that doesn't like the water? Now, if your dog doesn't like the water, I wouldn't connect the idea of you have to go into that water to make the retrieve. Uh oh, my connection says it's weak. If I lose you guys, I'm going to be back. But, um, so, but that's another thing that's an advantage when I use that stick scent when I'm using the training dummy in the water. So we're associating the scent, we're associating the shape to be positive. Now, the last thing I want to do is I want to show the real thing. Because I think this will be interesting. Ellie here is, sit. I'm gonna show you Ellie first. So Ellie here, the hard horn is relatively new to her. I would say that you, could, you can watch her first shed find ever. I've, we filmed it live a couple weeks ago, mid-February over in Buffalo County. And she picked it up after a while. She went right past it a million times. I'm gonna talk about that after this because we're gonna talk about transitioning to the field, okay? But when we, get a dog started on antlers, it has to be positive and their confidence has to be high. I went for quite a while with this dog on this training dummy. I would say Ellie's a year and a half old. So I don't, Ellie didn't pick up a hard horn until she was a year and four months. I mean, it was, it was a couple months ago, two months ago when she first picked, not even two months ago when she first picked her first one up. So what does that say? I'm very patient. Okay? I think that's one of the things that most people lack is patience and training. And I don't just mean it on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean it on an overall, the macro, not the micro. You have to have patience both micro and macro when it comes to training dogs. You have to have patience both micro and macro when it comes to raising kids. You can't expect kids to grow up overnight. I don't expect dogs to grow up overnight. You make the analogy to any whatever business you guys are in whatever you do for a living if you're a kid and you're in school you can't go from first grade 
to college. It just doesn't work. It takes time. Our system has been set up that way. Well, our system, I think, has been, I think dogs are wired to take time and most people want to fast forward through it. And that's where major, major issues come. So a year and four months before she was picking up a hard horn, she was very confident before she did it. And now I guarantee you within a year, I get through another shed season or two with her and this dog will hunt just the way I want her to be. And she'll be three years old. So I'll have 10 good years of shed hunting. Whereas if I decided, oh my gosh, last year she was six months old when shed season came around, I had to get her out shed hunting and have success. And I rush and rush and rush and rush and I have problems along the way. Now I've got 12 and a half years of struggles, potentially. So I'm patient. Be patient. I can't stress that enough to all of you guys. Be patient. Whether you're working on having a dog be quiet in the kennel or having a dog pick up a hard horn, it doesn't matter. Be patient. Ellie. Watch the difference if we're picking this up. Good girl. Good girl. No, 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 no. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, it's a good thing we're live, guys. Woo. Put this away. Come here. Come on. She been picking up hard horns, guys. Good, dead, dead. It's probably less than 25 times she's picked this up. What did she just do? She ran up to it, tried to pick it up with the tines up, and went uh uh, left. Now what what do I think got in the way of that? I'm so glad she just screwed up, and it and, and it would have been. In my younger days, I'd have been very embarrassed. I'd have been borderline pissed. I probably would have. Immediately, especially if this wasn't on, I just, I just, ah, 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 hey, 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 get over here. Look at her right now. What the hell is going on here? Very good. Now, what did I do when she made the mistake? I went, oh, shh. I took the phone immediately and I set it down. And I said, you know what? I just made a major mistake. I'm not into this. I, I didn't get, I, I blame that on me. So what I did was I set the phone down. I came back over and said, come on, come on, come on, come on. And I sent her, rewind it. Watch the difference of when I sent her the first time. Real cool, real, ah, she's gonna do really well. And then she struggled and I went, oh, where am I with her? I'm way back, I'm way in the beginning when it comes to hard horns. So what did I do the second time? Ellie. Gave her a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of tone, a lot of excitement. My energy was there. She ran up to it. She went like this, uh, 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 pick it up, bring it back. And tails are wagging. And I'm, you're so good, you're so good. I don't treat her like she saved the world when she picks up her dummy anymore. I did the first time. Listen to how I treated her, the puppy when she picked the dummy up for the first time. Treated her like she had saved the world. I treated her like she found a 90-inch shed. I got very excited because I needed that dog, that puppy, to understand that's what I'm looking for. So for the first time when, I, when my dogs do something, I really have to be there with a lot of praise. Then I start to back it off when the habits get formed. For a while now, I will get much more excitable with this pup when it comes to hard horns, okay? Because it just showed me I have to. I have to get her to understand that's exactly what I was supposed to do. All right, come here. Come on. Ellie, come on. Ellie, come on. She goes, I don't want to. Come here. Ellie, come on. Good girl. Come on, please. In your place. So, now, a couple of things I want to talk because that's the third. That's the third part. Okay, the hard horn. Now we went shape, we went scent, and we went feel. We covered it pretty quick. I don't know how long we're going here, but we went through it pretty quick. Okay, it's not that simple, and it's not something that just happens overnight. My dog's a year and a half, and we're still on the feel part. So take that into perspective. Okay. So then the last thing that I think is really important that I want to talk about is, and you guys keep firing away questions because I'm going to come back on it and, and answer these. Um, but the last thing that I think is really important is the idea of transitioning from this training stuff to the field. Because I see this becoming an issue. It becomes an issue for me, so it's got to be an issue for everybody else. But a couple things. 
One of the things is when we go shed hunting, when you guys go and do shed rally this weekend, and it's Saturday and Sunday, and you go, oh, I'm going to really find some sheds because I want to get in on this shed rally thing. And you're walking miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. Remember this. If you've got a younger dog or if you've got a, any dog, it's a lot like you, they need conditioning physically, okay? So the guys stay in shape. If they're not in shape, they struggle. They're breathing through their mouth, not their nose. In order to process scent, they have to breathe through the nose. So all that stuff is just science. But the other part is mentally, how tuned in are they? If they go for miles and miles and miles and miles and never find anything, they're just going for a really long walk and potentially checking out pretty easily. I struggle, I do really good in training, and I think most people do really good in training. I think they run into problems when they're actually shed hunting because they might shed hunt for hours on end and then they find a shed and the person gets very excited and they expect the dog to do what the dog did in the first, when they're in their yard and training and they do stuff for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Their sessions might never go more than 45 minutes. I have a hard time doing a session over 45 minutes with a dog because it's hard for me to get their focus through that. And usually I can get what I need to get done in 45 minutes. So the problem is, is when we're actually hunting, a lot of times it's hours on end before we find an antler. And it might be hours in between where we find an antler. And so for us to think that our dogs can go and replicate what they do, when you got them in the house... And then you take them out. Next time you do this to work with your dog, see how your dog reacts. You go get your training bag and you put your training bag on. Does your dog change? Does anything, do you notice anything different with his personality? Most of the time, my dogs are really going excitable. Tails are going, they're jacked up, they're ready to go. We go outside, we get into our routine. I'm guilty of this no different than anyone else. I get into my routine. I know in my head what I'm going to do. I'm going to work on this, 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 and this. We get out. Watch some of these old lives. I do this. I get into this routine. Boom, 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 boom. Within 35 minutes, I'm done and I'm back in the house. And usually by the end, my dog is spent mentally and physically. Okay? Now, imagine this. You get your dog out next time. Dog gets excited. Knows what things are going to happen. Knows things are good. And all of a sudden, you take the dog for a five-hour walk, and then you do your first drill. Do you think the level of excitement and how they're going to be dialed in and tuned in is going to be the same? Not a chance. So what I need to do is I need to try to keep them in it. I also need to realize and be realistic and transition my training and realize my first seasons or two or three or maybe four are going to be training, not hunting. When I go take a gun dog to the blind for the first year, most times I don't bring a gun. Very, uh, there's times I won't shoot. If I got other people with me, I won't shoot because I'm going to work the dog because everything I worked so really, really hard to get to, if it goes out the window because I'm worried about birds and hunting and all of a sudden my dog creates these bad habits that form just as quick, if not quicker, than the good ones that I've worked so long for. Shed hunting is the same way. So you can't take a kid fishing for the first time, musky fishing. It won't work. The kids won't want to go fishing ever again because there's a lot of guys that cast for days and don't catch fish. That's not very fun. So for a kid, for an old guy that's caught a lot of fish, it's a lot of fun. It's a challenge. It's all this. But that's like me taking a little kid out hunting for the first time and saying, you can't shoot a deer unless it's Boone and Crockett. They might shoot one in their life. Maybe never. So when it comes to shed hunting, this is the struggle that I have with sheds versus birds. If I want to get dogs on bird, if I want to get dogs good, they need experience. If I want to get dogs on birds, I go to a game farm and I can put out 50 birds and it's very simulated, it's very similar to hunting. It's maybe a little bit different, but it's close. But then what I do is and that doesn't because I get a dog that good at the game farm doesn't mean I have a good gun dog or bird dog. I have to hunt them on wild birds and a lot of them. The guys that have very very good dogs they're outfitters, they're hunters, they, they do this stuff regularly all the time. They get a lot of experience. They shoot a lot of birds over these, these dogs before they get good. Think about how long it takes. And the thing about bird hunting is I can go to South Dakota and by noon I can flush 100 pheasants. That's 100 opportunities for real life experience for my dog. There's a lot of us that won't find 100 sheds in our life. I used to find them in a season, not anymore. I shed hunt a lot less now that I'm doing this than I did before. It's a, it's a price I pay. It's a sacrifice I have to make. But 
There's a lot of people that won't find 100 sheds in their life, much less 100 sheds by noon. The dog needs the same amount of experience to get good with shed hunting as it does bird hunting, in my opinion. And so that's why we have to take advantage of the opportunities. When I saw that little dog walk past the shed the first time, Ellie, if you walked back, I filmed it. She walked past it three or four times. She was hunting. She just wasn't finding it. And it would have been, it took 25 minutes. It would have been very easy for me to get really frustrated and get down on her and get negative. And all of a sudden, I'd have a little dog that went, this sucks. This isn't that fun. So when we find a shed, when you guys are out for shed rally this weekend and you see a shed and you've got your dog, I don't care if it's the most seasoned dog in the world or never seen a shed before in its life, don't run up and pick it up. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to get away, so you're fine there. But make sure you get something good out of it. And I don't care if the dog has to trip over it. I don't care if the dog has to fall on it. I don't care if, the dog, if you have to get up there and drag it for the pup to get excited about it. Do something to make some, get something positive out of it and then build off of that. Now, nice part about shed dogs, I don't, think you can hunt, I don't think you hunt them too early if you have realistic expectations. And so I say that because if it's too early for them to have success and do well, then take them along and just get something. Get a win. Just get something out of it. But don't expect much more, and then you won't be disappointed. As soon as you get disappointed and get frustrated and get down on the dog, that's when you start taking serious steps backwards. So don't, don't have the attitude of, oh, my God, she didn't find it. Ugh, she walked right over. You know how many people have told me, Ugh, walked right over it? They're telling me, and I'm going, I don't think you like your dog very much. I can sense that. At that moment, they didn't like the dog very much. Your dog reads you better than you can read it. Understand that. And understand that your dog wants to make you happy. That's all he wants to do, make you happy. So find something the smallest part of success you can find and capture it and then build on it and then build on it and then build on it. So that's some transitional stuff. I got to see. We've gone probably 45 minutes maybe into this. Um, probably an hour. Okay. There was a couple other things I want to talk about really quick. One of them is it's because I've seen so many pictures of this. You've seen so many pictures of people taking pictures of little dogs with, chew, with antlers chewing on antlers. I've heard so many people go, ah, just give them antlers, let them chew on it. That's how I get a good shed dog. I'm going to tell you something. Chewing and chew toys and antlers as chews, chew, chews in general, are training tools. No question about it. They train the wrong thing. They train dogs to chew. Don't train something into your dog today that you've got to train out later. Take my word for it. One of the biggest mistakes you can do is give your dog stuff to chew on. Because they become chewers. I've got dogs that never see a chew toy. Ever. Never. And the, prop, the reason is, is because I don't want my dogs to chew. If you want your dogs to chew, give them all the chew toys in the world. But then don't complain when the couch gets chewed, the shoes get chewed, your wife's purse gets chewed, the you name it, whatever it is. Don't complain when things get chewed on because you're training them to chew if you're giving them stuff. You're not punishing them by not giving them toys. Trust me. You're doing them the biggest favor that you could do them in the world. Now, when they're, little, when they're puppies and they get their puppy teeth, they're not teething. When they are teething, is between four and six months. I've got about a month left with this pup to try to get some retrieving. Then we're going to stop for probably six weeks because we won't retrieve when they're teething. And the, pro the problem is, is I'm not going to form a habit today that I've got to have to train out later. I'm not going to teach a dog to chew on stuff. Well, I certainly don't want them chewing on this. I don't want a dog to run out, find a shed antler for me in the wild, and lay down and chew on it. That's what you're doing. I don't want dogs, when their mouths are sore, they have a hard time picking stuff up because it just hurts. It hurts. At that point, I'll give them some ice cubes. If anything, I'll give them ice cubes, and that's it. Because there's nothing in my house that they will confuse with an ice cube. And it'll help numb their teeth. And it'll give them that ability to relieve that stress. Ice cubes are it when they're teething. Even when they get a little bit older, I'll give it to them. I, they think it's a treat. I'll give them an ice cube once in a while. But the last thing I want is a pup to run down, pick this up because he really wants to retrieve because I'm working so hard to get Spry to understand this is a good thing and this is fun. And most dogs do it naturally. Spry is not doing it naturally. I'll figure that out. But... When they pick this up and they want to bring it back to me and I praise them for it, the last thing I want them to do is 
Go pick this up and then spit it out because it hurts. Pick it up, spit it out. It hurts. Pick it up, spit it out. It hurts. What are you doing there? You're forming a habit. It's the wrong one. Don't form habits today that you're going to train out later. Don't get dogs in the habit of chewing on stuff that you want them to retrieve. Now, the other argument that I have that makes, I think, a lot of sense is when you've got sheds laying all around. I've had so many people tell me that they just train their dogs good by just leaving sheds lay around the house and let them have them whenever they want. Okay. That, the, the percent, I'm a percentage, I'm a numbers guy. I want to set up my, everything in my favor. So I'm an, I, I like to have my odds, okay? I know for a fact dogs learn by forming habits, and habits are formed by repetition and consistency. There's very few people that will argue that. So let me play this scenario out. You've got 10 sheds in your house, your yard, the dog's kennel. Let's just say your dog goes through the house, it lives in the yard, it lives in the house, and it lives, has a kennel area. You've got 10 sheds spread out throughout those areas. Dog has access to walk past them 100 times in a day. Picks it up 10 times a day and chews on it because it's chew toy and they love chew toys and he loves antlers, right? That's what they're telling me. 10 times out of the 100, it picked it up and he chewed on it. Okay. I don't, what do I want? End game, I want dog, we're going to reverse engineer this. I want the end game to be pick up, smell, see an antler, pick it up, bring it back to me. If the if I'm training the dog to smell or see an antler lay down and chew on it, that might work. I'll give you, an, I'll give you that. But 10, 10 times out of 100, it might work. That's 10%. Nine times out of, 90 times out of 100, what did the dog do? Walked past it. It's always there. Walked right past it. What habit is being formed stronger in that scenario? Picking it up and chewing on it, which I really don't like to begin with, or walking past it. Nine times out of ten, your dog walked past it. You're training. You're, you're definitely training. You're training the wrong things. Make your life easier. Set yourself up for success. So that's all I'm going to... I, I could go on about that for a long time. But the reason I bring it up is because I've seen so many pictures. It's cute. If you're staging a picture of a puppy with an antler, fine. If the puppy has access to antlers all the time and you're letting them chew on them, talk... Uh, I'll get the email ready. I'll copy and paste it to you uh, in six months because you're going to run into it. It's inevitable. Repetition and consistency forms habits. Don't train the wrong habit in today. Okay? So that's enough preaching on that. So who's got questions? I'm going to roll through some of these. I'm going to spin this around, make it more fun for you guys. If you watch a puppy, you watch a dog, uh, I'll give you... She settled down nicely. That whining wasn't her. That whining was uh, Ellie. So I'm going to let you watch her. And I'm, going to watch, I'm going to let you watch how much she is getting used to the idea of, you know what, the kennel's not so bad. It's hard to see her in there, a little black dog, but she's there. Okay, let me scroll through some of these. First off, I want to thank you guys for doing this. I know it's breaking the mold of our, uh, our spry training. We did get a little bit of spry training in, um, but I am going to uh, touch base. I am going to do something with her later tonight when I get home. She hasn't ate yet, so I'm going to feed her. So I want to thank you guys for coming in. I want to thank you guys for sharing this, okay? This is why we do it, because just it, it has happened over the last six weeks now. Number 54 we've done with Spry. That doesn't count the other lives we've done in between. So probably total there's 70 live videos over the last six weeks. I never thought I would say that. When I first started doing this, I dreaded the idea of it. But because I've gotten so much positive response from it I kind of if I don't do it I feel guilty I feel like I'm missing out I feel like I'm not holding up on my end of the deal so I want to thank you guys for that share the heck out of it because that's how it got to this point and I think we can go a lot further with it so um so let's see here I'm gonna go through some of the questions kiddos are watching let's see Scott Adkins Remington could shed hunt at three months senior at Harrisburg Two years ago, followed your training. Three months is really this dog's three months old, so I think I think that uh, everyone's idea or perception of what training and hunting and finishing off is. I I'm not calling you a, I'm not calling you a liar, Scott, but I am saying it's really hard for me to to see a, what I consider a dog hunting at three months old. 
Now, I think you could form good habits. I think you could have some success. I think you could take steps the right way. But to be honest with you, I don't, what I don't like is the idea of other people trying to make comparisons and going, damn it, my dog's not doing it at three months. What am I doing wrong? If you are doing it at three months, that's impressive. It's really, really impressive. And I believe you probably are to a degree. Um, saw me at Harrisburg two years ago. I wasn't at Harrisburg. So I never did the Harrisburg show. Um, you may have seen me. I've done a lot of them, um, but I didn't do Harrisburg. But you followed our training, and I appreciate that, man. Um, I think that everyone has to realize their dogs go at different rates. And some are going to go faster and some are going to go slower. If you got one that's that accelerated that early, man, it's like that one, it's like that one, uh, enjoy it. Enjoy it because you don't come across those very often. It's likely not to happen again in, life, in, in, uh, in a man's lifetime. Uh, let's see, Kelly joined in. Good to see one live. Matthew got a, caught a live one. Um, shed rally, no doubt about it. Found the first shed on the year, on the on the year on the year last weekend. Oh, so last year, last weekend on the year, found his first shed. Checked trail cameras and had one buck that had dropped its antlers. It's going close here in Mississippi. We are a little slower down here, like you said last weekend. Now, I don't think all the deer have shed yet. That's the other thing that's really interesting. <laughs> That's the other thing that's interesting. I've had several people send me pictures of deer that are carrying one or both sides yet, right now. So, I uh, wish I could find some, but they're still carrying them. Clint agrees with me. Uh, shed hunting is always a good excuse to get the kids in the woods. Shed hunting is one of the best things, I think, because it just adds so much to our hunting in general, and it involves another opportunity for me to do something with these dogs. It's just, I'm really excited at the growth that shed hunting has, has kind of seen over the last few years and look forward to it. Um, continuing looking for a place to shed hunt I don't have much property um, that is a struggle that, that's one of the struggles with the downside of shed hunting's popularity uh, is it's become very difficult to get on property I used to be able to knock on the door and ask people to shed hunt and they would ask me what does that mean nowadays I knock on the shed hunt I knock on the door to shed hunt and they go ah my cousins do it or my brother does it or my nephew does it or we do it so it's just becoming a lot more difficult it's no different than bird hunting I used to be able to knock on the door in South Dakota and get on every farm now they're now it's much much more difficult, but uh, that's the bad with the good. You take the good with the bad. Um, Brian Britton, Luke was in. Wayne back. Wayne was back from Tennessee. Our buddy Wayne. He knows how to get in now and make it so that I can see he's in. So I'm glad we had a we emailed back and forth together. Uh, didn't realize it's showing my tracking page, but this is Lyle. Oh Lyle, Mavis Outdoors was in on it. So uh, getting a weak signal here. So I hope we don't drop. Uh, Michael Shriver, good evening. Alan was in. Sean. So how many years has Shed Rally existed? I would have to check with Alex at Whitetail Properties. I want to say it's the th fourth year, maybe. Um, I want to say three or four years. Uh, Mark shared it. Appreciate that. Found a new shed today. How do I preserve the shed to use later? It still has traces of blood on it. Just, just keep it. You don't have to do anything to preserve it. I think a lot of people get nervous about the idea of scent contamination. Well, I'll tell you right now, every squirrel that chewed on it, every coyote that picked it up, every thing that marked it, every tree that that buck rubbed, every scent gland that leaked onto it over the... It's got a bazillion scents on it. And none of them are going to be gone. Some of them will fade. The blood will fade. But I bet you any money that the traces of blood on it will be detectable by that dog's nose next year. Because it's never going to go away, away. Not for a long time. Um, the bone itself will have scent to it. So um, you, there's nothing you have to do to preserve it. And there's nothing you have to do to worry about it as far as avoiding other scents going to it. Your dog smells in layers. Separate scent in layers. So check out the Cabela's seminar. Uh, I, did a, I did something new in it. Um, I'll do it in more. I'll do it in the future too on seminars. But I did a, I did a demonstration on how dogs scent, and how we can envision it with our eyes to understand it. Um, but it was in the Cabela's seminar. I bring out a five-gallon bucket, and I got a bunch of stuff in it. And that's how I explain it. It was balls and hockey sticks and all sorts of stuff. So uh, this is when Ellie was creeping. We're gonna, we, I don't usually have the creepers. Um, I usually avoid that. Uh, we're going to make sure we avoid it with spry. We always place sheds 
for every hunt in case we come up empty. Beautiful, Angie. I did not talk about that. Put one in your back pocket. Don't go for more than 15, 20 minutes if you have to without getting a fine. So always end on success. The sheds are placed early. She's been do set them up for success. Angie knows her stuff. Chase was in. 85% of the ones we find are found because she sees it. Only 10% does she smell first. And I see most of them before she finds them. But she leads me to the right area and that makes sense. Absolutely. I think the people that think that they find 95% of them are either really bad shed hunters or they've been reading too many articles because that's just not the way this works. Um, Justin was in. Uh, Morels we talked about. They are blank canvases to make what we want. Absolutely. Especially when they're young. Now, I didn't talk about it, but age comes up. Can you do this with an older dog? Without question. My first shed dog is right there. She was eight years old before she ever picked up an antler. My first shed dog I ever bought as a puppy is right there. She was six months old when she poked herself with an antler. No, that's not. I'm lying. That's Taylor. Jeez. That's Taylor. Uh, Finn was. I don't have a picture of Finn on the wall. Um, but that's not. That's Taylor. I have to apologize. Uh, that's Remy. She was my first. Finn was the first pup I bought. Six months old. She's the one who jabbed herself. She's the reason I came out with the training dummy and patented it. Because that was the first time I ran into a problem when it came when this came up. Um, let's see. When do you start your dogs on a little games to use their nose? I want to train Lucy to track deer. And what do you do to start place? Did you see the video from this morning of feeding time? Did you see the? I did not see it, Justin. Did you send it to me? I didn't see it. Um, but. Uh, when do I, so games look back a couple weeks I would start out with a hunt command we started a hunt command with spry I use kibble so look at look at the videos back a little ways um, Justin we use a, we use food and I put it on a little floor mat in my house and I give her a hunt command I also did it in in Cabela's I also did it down in Milwaukee uh, this past weekend at the seminars so um, those are hunt command drills Real fun, real easy. Scented tennis balls and cover. Real fun, real easy. Those are good ways to start getting noses out of them. Place training. What do you do to start place? Go back to number one of our spry training. And then watch for like the first week. Because I spend most of my time working on place with spry. Uh, consistency and repetition. That's the answer. But the beds make a big difference. Elevated beds make a big difference. Um, having the right tools helps. Okay, So... Uh, Merrick was in, Sean was in, and that was when we were talking about, I think, the value of a shed to a dog. Naomi joined. Welcome, Naomi, if you're still on. Cardboard cutout. Not sure what you mean, Scott, on cardboard cutout. Uh, Fred Boland here again. I'm on my way. That was Ellie. I thought it was Taylor. Uh, that was Ellie, yeah. Uh, that was not Ellie, but I, I thought it was Finn. Shake antler like... It is a sack. What, what do that do? Shake antler like it, like it is a sack. What do that do? Not sure what that means. Hot lap. We had that. Um, oh, I think you're talking about. We do that too. I think you're talking about when she was head shaking. I imagine that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's just her. That's her lack of instinctive retrieve right now. We'll get it out of her. We'll get it out of her. It's gonna take some patience. No problem. We'll get there. Um, Trevor Barrett, great tip with the line. Thank you, Martin. It was something that I don't ever do. I never had to do it before. And I thought about it the other day because we talked about the influences of different harnesses and leashes that we have with the dog, especially when we're tracking. I put a separate leash and a separate track, uh, uh, harness on with my dog to understand that they can get out and heal. This little puppy just started to heal and she responds to pressure to the neck so well that I thought if I can figure out how to give her that little bit of a tap to the neck, just tap that neck, she'll come back to me. And it worked. So we're gonna try to build off of it. Uh, so this is where she made her, um, how do I teach hold? Hold conditioning, Kelly. I do not force fetch. I don't think you should connect negative to things that the dogs like. That's my approach. So force fetching creates negative con connection to retrieve and I don't want it. So I don't argue with people. I, my biggest gripe with hold conditioning is I ask a lot of people why they do it they say it's because we always did it. That's what we always did. And my answer to that is, or my response to that is, that's not a very good reason. I'm not interested in doing stuff because that's the way it was always done. It's got to make sense to me. 
So hold conditioning gets the same delivery, gets the same hold without the negative. So, um, so that I'll, so that's kind of the answer on that hold conditioning. I did it live, Kelly, um, with several dogs in the in the past. So you can look at those. And eventually we're going to do it with Spry. We also cover it in our DVDs. Um, my dogs all have struggled with hold, hold conditioning, and it takes time. And you have to be like. 100%. You can't do it 75% or it won't work. So it takes a major commitment. It takes a period of time. I'm going to say four weeks because if it takes three, you did well. If it, I should say six because if it takes four, you did well. Um, but hold conditioning takes a period of time. No retrieving during hold conditioning. That's a whole other topic. Um, April Marie is going through hold conditioning right now and sharing a lot of stuff to our page. Uh, Kelly, don't do it until the dogs are done teething and back to retrieving. So anywhere from like seven or eight, nine months old is probably a good time. I've done it as old as a year, 14 months. I'm just not in a rush. But I take a lot more time in everything I do than I think most. I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying that's how I, I go about it. Um, worked great. Exactly what I did with my pup, Jeremy. I'm assuming that's the tap to the neck. That's what I had to do too. So you guys have done it before. Where were you guys when I was struggling? Come on. Send me some tips. Uh, good evening, Vicky. Do you think retrieve could be cultural with Spry? You have her be involved with the older, like having her be involved with the older dogs retrieves. No, because I think, and I, I'm I'm assuming you think you're asking, will that help to get her to retrieve better by retrieving with the older dogs? I don't think that. And the reason I don't think that is, I think certain things have cultural impacts. Healing and packing in with us, I think did. Because it was very controlled, and, and I had 100% control of it, and it was very solid. Um, if I go and I throw a bumper out, and one of the bigger dogs picks it up, and all of a sudden a little dog comes running in and wants to take it away, I don't have any control. I certainly can't expect to control her at a distance, because I can hardly control her at my side. So what I don't want to do is lose control of everything and turn it into a keep away or a chase or a runaway with something in my mouth, or a tug of war. All of those things are habits that I have to avoid. So by incorporating the older dogs, now I don't know that she would learn anything by sitting and watching the dogs make retrieves. Um, I need to get it out of her. It's in her. I can't figure out how to get it out of her. Uh, good sign is when the dog regrips the balance to balance the antler. Yes, Wayne, they're understanding. They're learning how to figure this out. That's the whole point of it. Um, so you're absolutely right. What kind of whistle are you using? It's a British style two and a half, two eleven and a half. We just ordered some that are going to be dog bone. So uh, I believe they're in product, either in production or being shipped right now. So within a couple of weeks, I'm going to talk a lot more about the whistles. We'll have them available through our website. Um, but it's a peeless whistle. No pee in there. Brrr, doesn't rattle. Doesn't freeze up. Um, it's peeless. So it's a style, it's a European style. Um, I really like it. Doesn't flush game as much as a rattled pee whistle. Um, got four good retrieves in a row with the puppy bumper. Wasn't far, but it's progress. Absolutely, Afton. You got to win. Celebrate the wins. Remember what it feels like. I'm going to remember what it felt like tonight because it felt good. Yesterday didn't feel so good. Today reminds me of what it should feel like. So understand that I'll have bad times again and I got to remember back to this one. I got to remember back to the couple that have been good. Those are the moments that it make it worth going through all the crap. Uh, thanks for walking back through that. No problem. I don't know what that one was about. Before I send my dog, I break his focus on anything else. Get him cranked up by asking him if he's ready, are you ready, are you ready, and then send him to find the shed. The problem with that is you bubble him over. Scott, I want focus. I, I, I like focus. I work so hard to get focus. The last thing I want to do is bubble him over. Now, I think you got to find balance. I sent Ellie out a little flat for that antler, so I had to put a little bit more behind it. So if, if that's what it takes to get the first retrieve, good. Then do it again to get another retrieve, then another retrieve. But pretty soon, retrieves should become habit. I don't get my dog super jacked up because it sat for me good. Because I've sat long enough. It's sat long enough. I don't treat a dog like they're... 
doing something very special when they do something that they should do because repetition and consistency has proven to make it a habit. So you can get them amped up. You can get them amped up when you need to. But the problem I have with that is what happens when you really need them to get amped up? You can only get so excited. You can only get them so jacked up. So it's give them as much as it takes to get the job done and then back off. It's like sometimes i got to correct a dog relatively firm if they make a mistake. I don't correct them that firm every single time they make a mistake or they do the same thing. I correct them a lot less to get the change because eventually I'm going to need to give them more correction and I can only give them so much. Praise is the same way. So you got to be real careful. It's all about balance, finding that balance. The least amount to get the job done is what I'm looking for. Uh, hey, what's up, Roger Fuller? If you want to get them used to the feel of a real antler, why not let them chew on one while they're in their place? I just, talk, I just talked about that quite a bit, Hunter. Or, or will it interfere with the reward of finding one? It's going to form a habit. The habit will be chewing. I don't, I'm not interested in a dog chewing. I'm not interested in a dog laying down in the field and chewing on an antler and then getting up and walking away from it. And that's exactly what we're doing if we're giving them to them as chew toys. So be careful to reverse engineer whatever it is the end game is. Take steps back from it and figure out how to get to it. Okay? Don't get to something. You, you can't get to something by creating a bad habit that's going to get in the way. I'm picking my pup up in six weeks. What are the chances of him being ready by next shed season? You can take him, no doubt. I think your chances are very good of taking him. You should take him. If you had a, if it was six months old when shed season came, I would say take them with. Be realistic. Don't expect them to be finished shed dogs. I don't think we ever have a finished shed dog. That's the interesting part. People always ask me, how long till you finish them? Never. Then I don't have a date that I'm up against. And I mean it. Like I don't just say it to be smart. I say it because I mean it. I don't have... A, a, a landmark, a, a mark on the calendar that goes, I got to be done by here because I'm into it for a year. I don't, I don't know how long it's going to take before Sp Spry makes retrieves. Normally, I would say, she's probably about 10 weeks old. I'm going to make some retrieves in the hallway and I might even think about going out to my front porch. I can't even make a retrieve in the hallway yet and she's going to be 14 weeks. So by putting dates and times and, and durations on it, it just muddies the water. Here's one thing. I wrote an article called Great Trainers Know No Time. And the reason I wrote it and the point of it was dog, we, are, we, are, we measure everything in time. We have to be, at, to, we schedule stuff. We have to be, we use a clock. We use a calendar. We measure everything in time. These guys, they don't care what time it is. They don't care how old they are. They don't care how long they've done something. They don't care. So as soon as I stop worrying about how long or how... Now that comes with comparisons. Don't make comparisons to Spry. I had a person the other day that was talking with me about... God, I get kind of frustrated because I see Spry and how well she's doing. You see the highlight reels, guys. Now, during lives, you see some of the reality. Most of the people... That's why I'm doing them live. Because when things hit the fan, you see it. And how you fix it. Most of the time when you see trainers or people that are training their dog, it's a lot like social media. You're seeing the highlight reel. They don't post the stuff that sucks. They don't post the stuff that's no good. They don't post the stuff that's embarrassing. They don't post the problems. They post the stuff that's really good. And they're usually really loud about that. Don't watch that and go, oh, that's my standard. Because when, when it sucks on their end, it's just like when it sucks on your end. So don't make comparisons that way. Picking up my pup. Okay, so that one's six weeks. Shed should be the reward along with the retrieve, like a treat. If you let them have it all the time, antlers get old. They lose value. I totally agree with that. Um, I talk about this a lot. If if you had steak dinner every night, if I ate steak dinner every night, I wouldn't get very excited about a steak dinner. But for me, I don't have steak dinner very often, and I really like it. And so when I have it periodically, I look forward to it. It's got a lot of value to me. It's springtime now, and the ditches are full of garbage. Lots of pop bottles in the ditch. The reason the pop bottles are in your ditch are because they're not worth anything. If there was a $100 bill in every one of those pop bottles, how many would you see in the ditch? Not very many, because they'd all get picked up. 
because they're worth 100 bucks. I need to figure out how the antler equals value to the dog. The value comes in the retrieve, and I praise them to reinforce it. Trained my dog myself, and he's ready. And he is ready, good already. One year and four months old. It's awesome, Scott. You, you're, you're ahead of the curve, um, which is great. That's great. But what I'm going to say is, like for me, I'm going to go, well, I've got one that's a year and a half old. I think she's okay. I think she's pretty good. She's not done by any means. As soon as I say that she's done or we're to the point where she's real good, is we won't get any better. I want to continue to get better. I don't think I ever get the maximum out of any dog I've ever trained. And my goal is always to get more out of them. I'm realistic in realizing I never get it all. But boy, I'm going to try to. And the way I try is just keep trying to get better. Boy, I wish I heard this six months ago. I think Emily said that when she's talking about chewing. I saw her make that comment. You're not the only one. Now, I don't know how old your dog is, Emily. Can you reverse it? Yes. Can If you've been letting dogs chew on antlers and you go, God, I screwed this dog up. How do you fix it? Take the antlers away. If... If I eat steak dinner every night and then all of a sudden I don't get it for a month or two months or three months, the value comes gets higher, becomes more valuable to me. Take them away. I don't like to hear no chew toys, LOL. I feel like they need to get their energy out somehow. Yet, Jen, the problem is, is they're getting it out the wrong way. I'm all for getting energy out. I'm not all for getting energy out in a negative way not destructive. Get the energy out of them. And I think a lot of people are confused with um, dogs get tired mentally as well as physically. Physical is obvious, but mentally, if we challenge dogs mentally, it wears them out. So get, get something out of them in a way that's productive. That's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to don't get something out of them, energy out of them in ways that are destructive, okay? Productive, not destructive. Kids, you know, my kid, our kid really likes, I don't know what's Minecraft, Stampy Cat something, Smart Pants, something like that. She'll watch that all day long if I let her. It'll keep her occupied. It'll keep her busy. It'll do nothing for her as a person. It'll absolutely do nothing to help develop her mind. It'll do nothing to help develop her physically and help her keep in shape or anything. Now, will I give her a little Stampy Cat Smart Pants once in a while? I think it's Minecraft, yeah. Once in a while, that's a little treat. But Prodigy is a little math game that she plays on the same little computer, and all of a sudden she's telling me about multiplication and addition and all this stuff, and I'm going, maybe that little thing's not so bad. But it's what are you, what are you, what are we getting out of them? It's really productive for her to learn about math, and it challenges her mind and all that stuff. St Smart Pants Stampy Cats isn't getting her a lot better at anything school-wise, okay? So it's in my mind, it's creating some bad habits, laziness. I don't get much out of that. So what I don't want to do, what I want to do is get the energy out, but get it out with something positive. Will it take more work? Yes. Here's the thing, guys. Dog training isn't hard. It takes time, it takes repetition, it takes consistency. But it's not hard. But I'm not going to say it's easy either because it's going to take a commitment. If you've watched this for the last hour and a half, you're committed. I take that as a sign of commitment. I think you've got it in you. Now you have to apply it. You're getting a plan together by watching me. You're not training your dog by watching me. You need to train your dog as much or more than you do watch me. So we'll give you a plan. It's up to you to execute. Take them for a walk. Absolutely. Under control. And all of a sudden, look, I got physical, I got mental, I got all sorts of stuff, and it was positive. But taking them for a walk takes longer than just putting them in the corner or putting them in their kennel with a chew toy. Yeah, it takes work. I've never found anything that, get, that I got that was good that didn't take a little bit of work. My dog can smell, and I'm not picking on you, Jen. I know you're just kidding, but I'm not kidding. I'm being kind of serious. My dog can smell a scented antler or dummy from far away, but when I've gotten around fresh antlers, he doesn't smell them nearly as easy. I don't know what the conditions are. I think conditions make more difference. See, the, the thing about scenting is we use scent to set our dogs up for success. So my recommendation, John, would be back up a little bit with the scent. Don't make it so easy. Scent, my, this scent on that tennis ball, oops, this scent on that tennis ball, 
doesn't smell like a scent, doesn't smell like a antler. It smells like a hundred antlers. So it's condensed, it's concentrated, it allows for us to have success in training. Now start diluting when your dog has success to the point of maybe getting more realistic because that scent smells much stronger than a real shed in the, in the field. Some real sheds might smell more than that depending on the conditions. So scenting conditions are equal to or more important than distance or level or intensity of scent. Good conditions are moist, damp, cool temperatures. It allows our dogs to use their nose without having to cool off by panting. Moisture, a lot of moisture in the air, a lot of moisture on the ground. Bacteria needs moisture in order to be created. That's why you can dry stuff out and it won't spoil because the bacteria doesn't form. It can't be there. It has to have moisture. So when we sell those real hide pieces for tracking dogs, they're fleshed and dried, naturally preserved. No chemicals, natural. Okay? There's no moisture in them or very, very little, not enough to create spoilage. Spoilage is rotting. Rotting is bacteria that creates scent. So the antler, when the antler falls off, when the blood starts to rot, essentially, that creates bacteria and scent. So when you have good scenting conditions, it's no different than bird dogs. Uh, I've hunted pheasant dogs in the dry, windy, warm days in South Dakota on gravel roads where a bird ran across the road and went into the ditch, CRP. And I took the dog out and I went, oh, there's my last bird of the day. Put the dog in the ditch and the dog starts to hunt. Nothing. Never got birdie. Nothing whatsoever. The bird was right there. I just saw it. It went through tall grass and it rubbed up against a bunch of stuff. Left a ton of scent. Why can't my dog find it? Because the scenting conditions are so bad. But then I've had mornings where it's real damp and moist and dewy and it's cool and cold and my dogs don't have to breathe through their mouth to cool off and they just completely breathe through their nose. And I've seen them get, windy, get wind and birdie from 30 yards away and put their nose up in the air and work, 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 and then all of a sudden they're to the bird. It's about the conditions more than the, the bird. So the bird smells the same on the dry, windy day as it does the cool, damp day. It's how does the dog process the scent. The antler smells the same both days. It's just, what are the conditions like and how is the dog able to process the scent? But when you're talking about scented, back off on the scent a little bit. That's the nice part is you can control that. Um, how much are the cost? I don't know what you're talking about there, Marianne. Maybe the cots? Uh, our website would have the cots. Dogbonehunter.com uh, under apparel and gear, if that's what you meant. Thanks for all you do to help us be successful. You bet, Mark. That's why we're doing it. Thanks for the video. It went a little longer than we had planned. Deer out here in my neck of the woods are still carrying. Lots of them are. Willie joined in. Scene two still at both sides. Oof, we got a long ways to go. I got to speed this up. Uh, quick stupid question. I'm place training my two-year-old. She goes right on, only comes off when I heal her. She never fusses or barks. How long do I have her on it? As long as I'm in the living room she's on place is that okay sure that's okay and then eventually i want to be able to leave the room and eventually i'd want to leave them on there all day if if that's what you want to do i don't think there's a time on it it's not a stupid question i just don't think there's a lot i don't think there's a set time on it um i like dogs to be comfortable to stay on it as long as i want them to sometimes it's all day sometimes it's an hour so little puppies i gotta i think you gotta be smart you gotta understand that when they get up from sleeping they're gonna go all three of mine are sleeping when they wake up, they're going to the bathroom. So I think you got to be there to be there when they go to the bathroom to be able to get them out. So always enjoy the sermon. I hate to be the professor. Wyatt Anderson's the prof or the the pastor, father, reverend. You are straightforward and speak your mind. You have helped me understand how much, so much about training. I appreciate that, Chris. Um, I apologize for last night. I think last night I was a little short. I, I thought back on it. I gave Aaron Garlock a hard time. I gave Erin Garlock a hard time because I think she can take it. And I think she needs a hard time in order to get through some of the things she's doing with her dogs. So I felt a little bad about it. She's at a Ducks Unlimited. I know she's not mad at me because she's at a Ducks Unlimited thing and she messaged she's not going to be able to get in on this. But I really think uh, sometimes tough love, man. Hey, I want to be my buddies with my kids, but I also have to understand that they're my kids. So with you guys, trust me, I'm not going after anybody. But when I think you can take it, I'm going to give it to you because I think that's the only way you're going to get better. Uh, Kate found one today that we planted for. Excellent, Cam Cutters. Cam Cutters was going through, through all sorts of struggles. 
Um, and I saw some great videos that she sent of her making some retrieves and brush and cover with training dummies. And so now we're seeing success. Remember what it tastes like, KM cutters, because tomorrow might be bad, might not be as good. Remember the good stuff so you can get through the bad stuff. Uh, I picked up 26 this year in mid-Missouri. Great, great start for you. But recently went, well, I spot one. I've started bringing my back my dog back to me and then send him on the retrieve it, it the same as if we were training in the yard field is this okay or should I just keep walking and let the dog eventually find it home I think when you have those opportunities Mike I would not handle the dog I would not unless you have to I first would want to do so I don't know where you're at with some quartering and casting because I haven't even talked about quartering and casting yet we've talked a lot about retrieving shape condition and all that stuff and I use drills to do that I use drills because it's very controlled and I'm forming habits. But I don't line dogs in the field for retrieves naturally That that when we're shed hunting. That's an ex, that's further down. We need to get some quarter and cast. We need to get some bend. We need to get dogs working a pattern in a range and then finding it on their own. So that comes. So what you're doing I don't think is bad, but what I would rather see you do is work the dog into a pattern where you can get it downwind and then hunt command into it so that it's not so hand holding. I don't want dogs to expect me to line them to every shed. I want them to start realizing, holy cow, they're out here without me even hearing it or knowing it from him. Boom, there it is and bring it back. Now that takes time. So you found 26 this year. You've had some really good opportunities. You've had more opportunities than I've had with any of the dogs I've been training. So um, use that to try to get nat more natural finds for them. Here in a little late, you didn't miss much, Cody. We just started. Just kidding. Lost a deer for a minute. Lost the feed for a minute. Did you say there would be another live tonight? Just message. Um, I'm going to try to. If I get home in time, I'm going to feed the dog live. Just the puppies. Uh, or all of them, probably. Today was 14 hole conditioning for Tiffin. She'll be 17 months in a few days. Time doesn't matter, does it, April? Uh, age doesn't matter, I should say. My GSP, GSP does a light hold on the shed when we train. I have never bird hunted with him, so I'm not sure if it's just a bird dog nature, if it gives him a little pain. Any any thoughts? Um, more confidence, more confidence. I'm wondering, are you using the shed or are you using the training dummy? I think I'd use the dummy first, especially if the dog is shy to the hard antler. Um, then I'd, I'd use all sorts of stuff. I'd use canvas bumpers. You'd use fire, ho fire hose bumpers. Found out our fire hose bumpers will be in next week, guys. Um, so we will have those available as well. That's my, that's the canvas bumper that the version of the canvas bumper that I like the most. Um, I, April is going through it. She started out with the wooden dowel. I told her to switch over to a canvas bumper or fire hose bumper because it can give some dogs the ability to put a little more pressure on it and get comfortable with putting a little more pressure on it. So I think it's reverse engineering the problem, Larry. Um, I don't know what you're using right now for hold conditioning, but possibly changing the object, which you're going to have to do anyway, can help with that. And then firm it up, firm it up under the chin, under the chin, under the chin. I like to get it in the mouth and pull it sideways because I have a ten tendency for the dogs don't like it sliding through their mouth. So when I slide it through their mouth, the best way for them to stop that is to put a little more pressure on it. Um, so I've, I've had that, I've used that for success. Scott Atkins, learn it or not, this is great. I appreciate it, Scott. You've been active, and I, I don't know if you've been in on some of our lives before. So appreciate that. Uh, yeah, you answered my question about letting the dogs chew on the antler a couple minutes after I asked, but thanks for answering it again. Ha <laughs> ha. You bet. I, I, I struggle with keeping up with these things as they come, guys. Definitely one of the best videos for those training their pups, especially those who are a little further along in the process. Yeah, I, we talk about we talk tonight about stuff that isn't connected to spry. We've just been so focused on spry that because Shed Rally's coming up, I thought there's way more stuff we need to get into. Um, with If we get a good response and we get stuff like this, we'll do more of this. Uh, it's, when the weather gets nicer, we'll do a lot more because... That dog is mine, and that dog is mine, and that dog is mine. My dogs get trained typically last. My, I don't have a client's pup right now. I'm working to try to get one in right now. Um, I've got several that need to get in, um, and that's my plan yet for 2017. But these three dogs, it's the first time I've ever had in 10 years didn't have a client's dog in. All three of these guys are mine. That's her crying, sleeping and whining and snoring. dreaming hear her snoring so 
I got to get some stuff done with my dog. So you guys are going to kind of see some of that. I'm going to, I'm going to spry my, my goal for this coming fall. One of my goals, I got a lot of goals. One of my goals is I want to do a little more bird hunting, um, this fall. So I'm going to be preparing these dogs for, for that, both upland and waterfall. So, um, great answer. Thanks, Jeremy Carl. I took them away before I got home tonight. Oh, you guys, uh, when going on the road trip, do you keep, when going on a road trip, do you keep the dogs? When going on a road trip, do you keep the dogs? Yeah, I bring them all with me. Do you keep your dogs in a kennel? Okay, or for the kennel for the ride. Um, sometimes, just depends. If I trust the dogs, they, sometimes they ride on the floor of the truck. I, I'm big on passenger, the passenger side floor. That's where my dogs ride. I don't let them ride on the seats. Um, I just don't like the hair on the seats. I, I just, I don't, I'm not big on it. So I'll put them on the floor. Um, I don't have room always for the kennels. Um, if I don't trust the dog and I think the dog will get into trouble, I'll put it in a kennel, set them up for success. Um, on a new piece of property, how do you deal with the fear of dog running away or losing them where I'm at? I've used a large cardboard cutout to give him distance, but I don't want too far or gone completely goes back to um, range and control. My dogs don't work out much more than 25 to 35 yards. That's where I want them. Because I challenge anyone that says they want the 75 to 100 yard rangers as far as dogs, the range. I challenge them the next time they go shed hunting, and I mean really shed hunting. If you're in a hay field, Stevie Wonder can see a shed at 100 yards. I don't need a dog for that. What I really need the dogs for is when we get into thick bedding, when we get into CRP, when we get into cornfields, when we get into a lot of cover. I challenge you, the next time you're shed hunting, just stop. Remember me saying this. Take a look around you and let me know if you can see much more than 25 to 35 yards in any direction. Nine times out of ten, you can't. So I want that dog to work that cover. So my, how do I keep a dog? I don't care what property I'm on. I don't care if uh, it goes no, not only for shed hunting, but just for anything, going anywhere. My, my fear of keeping dogs from running away goes back to the foundation. That's why I'm spending so much time on, with Spry on recall, heal, sit, stay, come when I call you. That's the stuff I spend 75. Uh, Scott, for, for the next 10 months, Spry's three months old. For the next 10 months, I bet you I'll spend 85% of my time on heal, sit, stay, and come when I call you. Those four things. And when, by the time I get through that next 10 months, she'll be really good. I'll take her, I'll walk her through uh, an expo center with 10,000 people off lead and she'll heal by my side and I won't even have to look at her. I'll feel her. She'll feel me. That takes some time. It takes, uh, I need that control because I go to a new piece of property. I, the last thing I want to worry about is dog running off. So I extend distance with lining with trailing memories. You'll see me get into some of that stuff. Um, but so it all comes back to control. I, I, I won't take it. If I don't have a dog that listens to me on lead, I can't take him off lead. So really got to reverse everything and go back to the beginning and found, build the foundation. That's why I don't care if dogs retrieve the lights out when they're four months old. If I can't get them to come when I call them, they're useless to me because I only retrieve stuff for a real short window of time during the year. What I do 12 months out of the year is I go to family events. I go to soccer games. I go to expos, I go to banquets, I go to all these things, and I need to have that stuff first and foremost. And if I have that stuff, the hunting part comes easy. It's a foundation that doesn't come so easy. It takes the most time. Uh, my year lab, my year old lab doesn't want to get too far from me in the woods. How do I get him to get away from me a little bit? Build his confidence. A lot of that comes from confidence. So not sure where you're at um, with some of that stuff, but building confidence Letting them understand, I don't know, maybe you're really, really solid on heel work and they go, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be able to get out here. Um, I think you can do things to change the scenario where you, uh, I've heard some people put bells on their dogs when they, sh when they hunt them and I think it makes sense for them to, for a lot of reasons, keep tabs on them and all that stuff. But I think it's also a marker for the dog to understand they can get out. I put a harness on a tracking dog to understand that they don't have to heal, although I do have a lead on them. If I put a lead on most of my dogs, they just, like a magnet, they get into heel position because I work so hard on it. So you might have to change things up a little bit, but confidence and, and get the dog to find, I, a lot of times to keep dogs from, from getting too much range, 
I don't ever let them pick stuff up 100 yards away because they're going to start thinking they can run off 100 yards on me. And if I can't control them at 10, I won't be able to control them at 100. Now, if you can control your dog at long distances, that's fine because you got control of them. But one way of doing that is, is you just you don't let them make fines that far out. Uh, Brad, Ty Bradley got in late, but that's all right. They're recorded. Um, I've used a large cardboard antler cutout and painted it white. Put it out 100 plus. Place real antler behind the cardboard. Trains them for a distance. But thick cover is okay to go. It, it's okay to be 25 to 30 yards. Yeah, I think so that's contradicting the distances. Dogs don't understand if they're in thick cover, if they're in a field. They get used to range. I get dogs that get a certain range and then they check back in. As far as the cardboard cutouts, my only concern with that is, do I want, I don't know that I struggle with dogs seeing stuff very often. It's usually nose work that I have the issues with. So I don't know that I want dogs investigating out 100 yards. I know I don't. I, I know I don't. Because I also bird hunt with my shed dogs. And I don't know that I can shoot more than 30 yards. So I don't want my dog out more than 25 to ensure that. So that's part of my reason. Now, the other thing with the, with the cardboard cutout idea, to me, is they run out there and they pick it up, but then what? It's still out there, right? So what do they real? I don't know if they realize that that one ha- doesn't have something, but this one does. And so to me, it's a sight recognition thing. I get that, but I don't understand how it correlates or connects back to the idea of I'm going to go look for these big white, white things in order to find an antler. I just haven't had that issue. Um, sight to me usually comes pretty e- Sight to the dogs usually comes pretty easy. If I start out with some marks and I go to trailing memories and then I start adding some of that stuff in. Sorry to leave early. Lent services tonight, Jamie. I will never hold that against someone. Uh, I've got good, I've got, I think faith is a really important part of our lives. No apologies. Uh, thanks. And we've moved on to the real deal for a few months now. Awesome. Um, I notice your dogs always have eye contact. How do you develop that time, trust, connection, feel? takes time. Um, part of how I get that, Justin, is because I'm so picky about the foundation stuff. The foundation stuff is where that develops. And then it extends into the field. I still have, I get really good eyes at 200 yards out of Taylor. But it, it started because I got them at 20 yards, and then it started because I got it at 2 yards. And then it started because I got it at 2 feet. So starts baby steps, and then we move on from there. Um, takes time, though. Don't don't think it happens overnight. Yes, also want to know how to get the eye contact. Same thing. I think the when you get the eyes, you know you've got them. And so I think you can get the eyes during feeding time a lot easier and a lot quicker. Um, go back and watch the spry stuff, and that's exactly what you'll see. My dogs heal really well with a lead. When I take it off, he wants to stay just ahead of me about a dog length. But I figure I did figure eights, and he still stays the same length. Why? Because he's not, you're just not getting it. You're not sinking it through to him. Um, so well, I wouldn't do figure eights. I'd do 180s, and I'd turn left-handed into him. So before the second, I wouldn't let him get a dog length and a half ahead. A second he gets a shoulder length ahead, I'd turn into him and I'd go back 880 degrees. So I'd walk a straight line and then I'd turn around and go the other way. Then I'd turn around and go the other way. Then I'd turn around and I wouldn't wait till he gets a, a, a length and a half. So as soon as he, if he's, if he's paralleling me and he gets that much, see my one finger on the corner? He got that much in front of me. Turn into him. Go back the other way. Catch him. Because he's going to start, A, making eye contact with you <clears throat> to make sure he doesn't get caught. And I wouldn't do it, and, and if you've got it good on lead, then the next thing I would do is take the lead and just drape it around his neck and see if he thinks he's still on the lead and see if you can do the turns and not get him caught without the lead being in your hand. Have it hanging from him or wrapped around his neck. I'll show you that when we get to that with Spry. Um, but, and then I'd go 180. I wouldn't go figure eight. Um, but don't let it get to the point where it's a dog length and a half. That's too far. That's like correcting the dog after you got three steps off the bed. You missed it. You need the correction to happen when the foot comes off the bed and touches the ground. The second it hits the ground, we've got to be there to correct. Then it understands. So there might be some gray area there for, for your pup, Jeremy. Um, Going to have to rewatch this. I was out socializing Thor with friends, little kids. I'm happy to report you. Great. Awesome. It's a dominance thing with the nipping. So 
Trudels are, are making progress with Thor. Uh, is it is a Bloodhound harder than a lab? I, pr Bloodhound's probably better got better ability to process scent. I, I don't know if it makes it harder or not. Um, different style. It's going to be a different style. I don't know where the retrieve comes in with the Bloodhound, but to be honest with you, I don't know where the hell the retrieve is in Spry. So um, we're in the same boat maybe with that. But if I think different breeds have different styles and different things suit them well, the nose work on your Bloodhound is probably better in comparison to some of my labs. But I think my labs have good enough noses to do the job that I'm asking them for. Your dog probably has a better one. Uh, the natural retrieve, I don't know if it's there. Um, the willingness to please, probably the same. Um, so I don't think we can use breeds to make excuses for whether dogs do well or not. Um, I think I would take the same approach to it, Justin, and f try to find out and fine tune what my dog does well and what it struggles with and work on it from there. Um, I have a three-year-old lab now. How old should I let him get before I get another puppy? No, no different than any of my other answers that come with time, Matt. There's no, I don't have a hard and fast answer for that. Depends on you. Um, I think it's nice to space. I think three is a nice age to space them out. I think three is when they start to grow up a little bit. And when I say grow up, I mean start to listen. No, I think they mature and they become. Um, they take a step in maturity. They, they just they develop mentally and physically. The mental part catches up to the physical part. Um, so I think that's a nice time because by the time your next dog's three and to that point, you're going to have a six-year-old. Um, I think it depends on life expectancy. I think they're going to live anywhere from 12 to 15 years. I know some people that will never have two dogs. So some people wait till they lose the first and get the second. So I, I, don't, I don't have the answer for it. I think there's pros and cons to it. Um, I like spreading them out. If it's me personally, three years is probably a pretty nice time to start thinking about it. Uh, thank you for the knowledge and sharing experience. Love shed dogs and shed hunting. Thank you, Scott. Great, great participation tonight. I appreciate it. Then I'm going to wrap this up, guys. Any different advice from a retriever to a pointing dog? The only difference is, the differences that I see, that I realize is their styles are different. There's no doubt about it. I've seen that with Wyatt's dog, Hutch. And now he's got uh, little Mildred, who is a, a British lab from from us, um, from that we've got from Wild Rose. So... Um, they are distinctly different. I don't know that the, the, the big picture of training is any different. I think they still learn the same way. I think you have to realize some of them have strengths and weaknesses. Some retrieve, some pointers just don't retrieve very well. Um, some do very well. So that's one thing. Most, very few times have I ever found retrievers that don't retrieve. Labs, they retrieve. Goldens, they retrieve. Spaniels, great retrievers, maybe better than any dogs I've ever seen or worked with. So um, I think the styles might be different. Uh, you, I think we talked about it, Michael, um, and you said it, and I agreed with it. Sometimes we're not going to get these little pointing dogs to sit the way I do my retrievers because you might be looking at pointing with your dog, and you don't want the pointing dogs to be sitting. You want them woeing. Same thing, just looks different. Uh, skill sets, the same, steadiness. Um, so I think there are some tweaking that, that happens, um, but I don't think anything is drastic. I don't think you are approaching training to different breeds like they're apples and oranges. They're all vegetables. They're all fruits are pretty close. Um, the, this, the, so maybe that wasn't a good analogy, but the, uh, they're not drastically different. They learn the same way. Um, amen to that. We shed hunt with our herding dog mix and he does great because of the solid foundation no doubt you you explained it better than i did kelly the as long as you have a good foundation you can do just about anything with them uh you guys thank you so much this was a long one it was a special one shed rally do me a favor hashtag the hell out of shed rally this weekend um and then also if you would hashtag dog bone hunter into it as well I really think that we, as a group, can make a nice impact, can make a nice um, addition to the parts and pieces of Shed Rally. And I want that I want everyone that's associated with Shed Rally to realize the impact and the power and the numbers and the strength and the group that we've got out there that are doing it with dogs. Um, I just I just think it's such a great part of shed hunting, and I want to show the support of it. So thank you guys for all of your support. Thank you guys for following. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, 
if I get home in time, I uh, may go live here real quickly with feeding these dogs. But like I told you guys, I'm a bachelor this weekend. Uh, my wife is in Atlanta for work, and the kids are gone. And um, what else do I have to do but work? I, it's just my life, I guess. I like it. It's all right. So I'll talk with you guys later. Have a great rest of your night, and uh, we'll talk soon. Keep asking questions, and uh, we will continue to do these things.